So let me tell you the story. It was the summer before freshman, before freshman year of college. It was the summer after high school. It was the summer before college started. And my would-be roommate, Kevin Wakefield, who some of you have met, we had known each other our entire lives, literally since birth. We were friends from, uh, from since I was two months old. We'd known each other forever, better than anyone else. And the summer before, we would move in together to be roommates at Olivet Nazarene University. For fresh, we went there for freshman orientation. It's where you go before your first semester. You get orientated, right? Uh, it's where you do all the things. Um, you, you get your first semester class schedule. You, uh, you meet your roommate if you don't already have them picked out. You get to know who your classmates are going to be. It's, they have all these events. You stay up late and do all these things. But they also have, if you want, you can take some tests at freshman orientation as you're preparing to go to school. They have what's called CLEP tests. Uh, college level examination preparation so you can clep out of some of your gen eds um, and so we you know we took the clep tests and were able to get out of some of our general education courses uh, but you can also take the act at freshman orientation uh, before the semester started you could you could take the act if you hadn't taken it prior but maybe you wanted to take it again to, to get a better score and that's what i wanted to do i had a 27 on the act prior to freshman orientation and uh, and I wanted to take it again because if I, could, if I could get my ACT score up to a 29, then I would get more scholarship money. So I wanted to take the ACT test again. And so I was like, all right, if I can get two more points, I get more money for scholarship. My roommate, Kevin Wakefield, had a 32 on the ACT. He's a smart cookie. Prior to orientation, he had a 32, and, and he had committed to taking the ACT again to see if he could get, again, like me, two more points. Because if he got his grade up to a 34, well, then he got full tuition. Then he didn't have to pay anything in tuition. Full ride. It's a big deal. So the morning of the ACT test arrives, and, you know, we're 19, 18, 19, 19 at that point, hanging out with friends. Staying up late. Morning of the ACT arrives, and, and I, I get up. I'm getting ready. I probably put a tie on because I would wear ties for tests. It's a weird thing I do. <laughs> but I look over, and Kevin's sleeping in bed. And so I said, Kevin, you need to get up, man. We got to go. We got to go take the test. He doesn't say anything. So I kind of got a little closer and talked a little louder. And I said, dude, are you getting up? The test is in 15 minutes. We got to go. And he rolled over and he said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it. I'm too tired. And like a good friend, I got kind of angry with him. You see, I loved Kevin. I knew what he was capable of. And I, got a little, I got a little impatient with him. And I kind of hollered at him and I said, what, what are you talking about? So Kevin, get out of bed. You have a 32 on the ACT. If you get two more points, you're going to school for free. You're going to not take this test again because you're sleepy? You're going to miss out on potentially going to college for free because you're tired? Brother, get out of bed. You're taking this stupid test. And I practically drug him from his bed to Burke administration where we took the test in the basement of the building. I was rather indignant. Here I was trying to get two, two points so I could get a little bit more, more money and he would rather get an extra hour of sleep and miss out on his 30, potential 34 on the ACT and, and miss out on getting a full ride, full scholarship. So move ahead a couple hours and I got a 28. Uh, not quite, not quite what I wanted, not quite enough for the scholarships that I wanted. But Kevin almost missed out on a full scholarship worth well over $100,000 at the time that I went to school because he was sleepy. And guess what? He got his 34 he got a 34 on the ACT. He paid no money for school. So yeah, he owes me a little bit of money. <laughs> I drug his sleepy butt out of bed. So, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Kevin was already accepted into the school. 
He was already going to Olivet. He was already in. He's brilliant. He's like too smart. One of those people, you know, doesn't really have to work. He just knows everything. He and his wife, it's really, you know, they were my smart friends. He comes from a good and affluent family. Him going to Olivet was not a question. He was going to be able to afford it. He was going to be able to do all the things. His being a part of Olivet was not in question. This test was not determining if he was in or out. It was determining how full of a scholarship he was going to receive. It wasn't about being in or out. It was about full participation in the scholarship. And church, that's the message today. Full participation. That's the message. The question is, how frequently do we miss out on the fullness that God has for us because we're sleepy? Because we're a little tired. Maybe not literally, but maybe because... Maybe not because we don't want to get out of bed. Or maybe actually, maybe it's exactly because we don't want to get out of bed. Oh, Sunday's the only day I have to sleep in. I hear that one a lot. But the message today is about how frequently we miss out on the full life that God has for us because we would rather pull the covers back over our head. How much we miss out on the fullness that God has for us because we would rather stay in the dark and keep the shutters closed because we would rather dwell in our stupid state than wake up and try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. And I just realized I didn't read Ephesians 5, which is the text from which I'm preaching. So let me read Ephesians 5 at this point in the message, which is a great time to read it. For you were once darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful to even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the world. So the message today is about how frequently, frequently we miss out on the full life that God has for us because we're sleeping. Because as, as, as the writer of Ephesians says, sleeper, wake up. You know, the church has a term for this sleepy faith. It's a term that maybe gets used every once in a while, but we don't really reflect much on. It's a term called sloth. Sloth is one of the seven deadly sins, right? What's, interestingly, what's interesting about sloth, though, is that it's the only one that's passive. Of the seven deadly sins, six of them are active sins that you perpetuate against someone else or God. But sloth is a sin of undoing. Every week during our Eucharist uh, liturgy, the table, we ask God for forgiveness for the things we have done and for what we have left undone. That's sloth. Those things we have left undone. Sloth is the root of those things that we have left undone. We'd rather avoid the person than have the hard conversation with them. We've been buttonheads for a while, but you know what? I'm going to go this way because I see they're coming. I don't want to talk to them. I'm going to avoid them. I want to face them. We'd rather give in to the tantrums than do the hard work of forming. Formation. Parents, can I get an amen? We'd rather throw our own fit then exercise self-control. That's sloth. That is sloth. Sloth is sleepiness. Or properly, sloth is carelessness. You see, the Greek word that means that gets translated into sloth is translated directly as not caring. It's Acadia in Greek. It's a fun word. Not caring. 
caring. So sloth isn't laziness. Or sloth isn't doing nothing. You see, that, that doing nothing can actually be incredibly important. We in the church have a term for it. It's called Sabbath. Sloth is not the absence of activity. Sloth is carelessness. A lack of diligence. A lack of intention. In fact, <clears throat> our own busyness, church, can be a form of sloth. Do you, know, do you know how frequently, how frequently we use our busyness to avoid hard things? Ah, oh, I'm just too busy. I can't have that conversation right now. Oh, I'm just so busy. I, I can't focus on this thing. Church, I had sloth this week. Can I confess? Thursdays are my writing day. I didn't know what on earth I was going to say today. I was struggling so hard because Sunday night, Monday, all day Monday, and all day Tuesday, I had district meetings, which I love to be a part of these credentials meetings, but they took up the first half of my week. So come Thursday when I'm writing, I've not done any of my research, I've not done any of my, of my preparation for writing my sermon. So I feel behind the eight ball. I got a lot of work to do Thursday. So I camp at the coffee shop and I try to get stuff done, but then there's a project here that's nagging me. There's so many things going on right now in the church that, I, that need my attention. And truth be told, I was hitting a wall with my writing and I needed to break up my mind a little bit. So I came to the church and I started working on a project that needed to be done. I wanted to get the wireless router out of the Adventure Kids room and into the booth here in the sanctuary. It's an incredibly important task, mind you critical to the running of the church and definitely something the lead pastor should be taking on himself. I was busy. So I was avoiding the hard work. That sloth. If sloth is carelessness, the, o- the opposite of sloth is diligence. You see, when, when, we t- when we think about sloth, we tend to think that the opposite of sloth is industriousness. It's a Protestant work ethic of putting your nose to the grindstone and just getting it done and work harder and more and faster, be more productive. This very American Protestant work ethic, we tend to think that the, the cure for sloth is to just do more. Oh, I'm not getting enough done. I got to work harder. Martin Luther said, and I love this quote of his, he said, man, this is the Quantstrom paraphrase. Um, He said, I have so much to do today. I'm so busy. I must spend at least three hours in prayer. I've got so much to do today. I got to be in prayer. We can avoid hard things. We can avoid great things. We can avoid important things in the name of busyness. You see, our busyness can be for us a form of carelessness, a form of sleepiness, a form of sloth. There's a German theologian and philosopher named Joseph Pieper, and he writes extensively about sloth, and he wrote, it is true that the senselessly exaggerated workaholism of our age The senselessly exaggerated workaholism of our age. Do you feel that? I'm talking about sleepy faith today. You awake is directly traceable to sloth. He says that our workaholism is because we're slothful. He said that the opposite of sloth is not workaholism, but here's a great word, magnanimity. Or greatness, fullness. That's a $5 word, isn't it? Magnanimity. It's greatness. Magnanimity is an unselfishness. One of the direct translations or direct meanings is generosity. Magnanimity is a courageous generosity, and it comes from... 
a fullness of self. We can be magnanimous. We can be courageously generous when there is a fullness of ourselves. To be magnanimous is to be generous because you know that in your giving, you're not losing anything. How frequently do we, do we not give of our time, our talent, or our treasure because we feel like we're going to be less without it? Because I'm going to be less, or we're going to have less, or there's going to be less. We live in the zero-sum mentality as if in God there's not enough. But magnanimity is a generosity that says, I don't lose out in generosity. I am not less than. As we read in Psalm 23 this morning, I shall not want. I love how the message paraphrases the psalm when Eugene Peterson, Peterson translated it as, I have everything I need. How can we say that? Why? By what means can we testify that we are without want? How can we say that we have everything we need? Because the Lord is our shepherd. Because the Lord leads me beside still waters. Because the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. Because the Lord comforts me with his rod and his staff. That is magnanimity. That is greatness. That is fullness. Magnanimity, greatness, generosity without question, courageous generosity is possible because of who God says you are. Someone awake today. It is possible because of the assurance that you are God's beloved. I'm convinced, church, that we miss out on the greatness that God has for us, the fullness that God has for us, because we're sleepy, because we're tired. A good example of what this magnanimity is, what this, gener what this courageous generosity, what this greatness means, because I think sometimes we can have a misunderstanding of what it means to be great. This week, uh, this week, Kayla and I went to breakfast. We try to get breakfast together during the week if we, if we have a chance. Every week, we want it to be a priority. With two little ones around, we don't get much time together. So we want to create that time together. So Wednesday morning, we, we went over to Mills Landing. I know it's Riverwalk, but it will always be Mills Landing. We went to Riverwalk Cafe, and we had breakfast together. And we were talking about all of this, and quite honestly, Kayla was quite inspiring to the message today, but we were talking about what this greatness means. And Kayla, in her, in her humble spirit, said, I think I kind of feel that a little bit. And I said, the, uh, of that lack of greatness a little bit. And I said, oh, talk to me about that. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I feel like at work I could, like, I could do more, and I, I feel like I could, I could, like, I feel like I'm not reaching my full potential in my career. And I know I could do more and probably make more and, and, and probably move up a little bit. She said, but I just don't feel like I, I can do that. And I said, oh, Kayla, that's, no, your greatness is that you are prioritizing important things. To be great is not to climb the ladder. To be great is to love your kids and your family. I said, you are, that, that is, you are magnanimous in the prioritization of your energy. And I said, you are a great mother in the full sense of the word. You are not less than because you're putting first things first. That's greatness defined not as the world defines greatness, as superiority or domination or being above or better than. Magnanimity is courageous generosity. And I see that so much in the way my wife mothers. Courageous generosity. But I'm convinced that we miss out on the greatness that God has for us because we're sleepy. Because we'd rather just kind of stay in bed. 
Listen to this, church. This is from, from Peeper again. He, he wrote, I don't, like, I don't always quote people, but these are so good. Well, he says, one who is trapped in sloth, Acadia, in sloth, has neither the courage nor the will to be as great as he really is. He would prefer to be less great in order to avoid the obligation of greatness. Let me read that again. One who is trapped in sloth has neither the courage nor the will to be as great as he really is, as he actually is, as God has created him to be, because he would prefer to be less great in order to avoid the obligation of greatness. That's sleepy faith. We want to do enough to get in But do we want to do so much to be great in the way that God sees us as great? Greatness as magnanimity, greatness as fullness, as courageous generosity? How much do we miss out on who God wants us to be? Because that might require something of us. Because it might take our time and our talent and our treasure. How much do we miss out on who God has called us to be because that requires work, because that requires courage and grit and tenacity? Now, I, 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 I'm tired. Let me just pull the covers over. I'm just going to stay in bed. I know that there's a whole lot that God has for me. Um, it's too much. The burden is too much. Once I'm in the do- I'll get in the doors. I'll get in. Once I'm in, I'm good. Then I can sleep a little bit more, right? I'd rather just not have to do the work that God has for me to do in order to be as great as God would have me to be. How frequently do people miss out on being made well because the remedy feels worse than the the disease? How frequently do we miss out on the care that we need because going to therapy feels harder than facing our shame? How frequently do we miss out on being made well because the cure is work? Because it's harder to eat well and exercise than it is to to just avoid mirrors. Do you know how many people I've met in this life who say they want to be made well, but when they're given the path to wellness, they don't want to do it because it's just too hard? That is sleepy faith. And I want to tell you, church, that sleepy faith is a false humility. It is a false humility. That sleepy faith that says that I can't be that, that I can't, that, uh, that, that God can't use me for that, whatever that is, that's a false humility. It's not actually humble. Because humility is not dishonest. It's falsely humble because it's a lie. It's falsely humble because it's not about what we are incapable of doing or being. It is about our carelessness. Our sloth, our avoiding the hard, doing the hard work. You see, church, I don't, I don't think that this conversation is about, is about being in or being out. I don't think this is a conversation about are you going to heaven or going to hell? Are you saved or are you unsaved? I think this is a conversation about living fully, as fully as God would have us to live. You've heard this quote from me before, and you're going to hear it again from St. Irenaeus. He said, the glory of God is humanity fully alive. The glory of God is humanity fully alive. So if we deny the fullness, the greatness, the magnanimity that God has for us, we are not only shortchanging ourselves, we are, but we're not only shortchanging ourselves, we're actually displaying a faithlessness. Well, God, I can't be that. I can't be who you want me to be. That's a faithlessness in what God can do. Sloth is a despair of faith that God is not capable of creating within this a fullness of life. 
I want to, I want to, I'm wrapping up, church, I promise. And she doesn't know I'm going to do this, and I didn't know I was going to do this. But there is for me an example of magnanimity, of becoming who God wants us to be, living into the fullness that God has for us. As you know, this week I spent time on the credentials board, I mentioned it earlier, interviewing candidates for ordination, interviewing candidates for their district license. And, and this week, we, it's always a privilege to be able to talk to folks who are getting their first district license. Don McPeak is here this morning, stumbled through our doors because of the snowstorm. And Don was in our credentials interviews this week. She was being interviewed to get her first district license. And I'm not going to get into the, all the nitty-gritty of the conversation we had. But Don's life has been anything but easy. A lot of grief, a lot of heartache, and a lot of grace. And when we were talking with Dawn about the call that God has for her, I was so grateful that this woman who's lived a hard life, that this woman who has seen the grace of God come in her life in so many ways, at a later state in life, did not say, oh, I'm too old to pursue the greatness that God has for me. Who believed in the call greater than the lies that her life had told her. And in those credentials interviews, Don McPeak was for me an inspiration to pursue the fullness that God has for you. And God has placed on Don a call to ministry. And even after decades of hurt, after decades of being told she wasn't enough, the voice of the Lord was stronger and calling her to say, no, I've called you to this. Do not deny my call. How much do we miss out on the call that, ha- that God has for us in our lives because we'd rather stay asleep? Because the call to do is, is a call to work. Try to figure out what is pleasing to the Lord. That's work. I'm so grateful that by the providence of God, Dawn and her husband are here with us today. Because there is no point in our lives when we can sleep on Jesus. He is always calling us to to a fullness, to a courageous generosity. See, it's not about being in or out. It's about the glory of God being revealed and our being fully alive. So wake up, church. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from your slumber of death. And Christ will shine on you. (laughs) That is, your life will reflect the light of the world. Ooh, that's good news. Wake up, rise up from the dead, and do not sleep on the fullness of life, the courageous generosity, the magnanimity that God has for you. Rise from the dead. Now I'm sleepy. And I promise you, church, it takes work. I'm not talking about being in or out. I'm not talking about God's grace saving us or not saving us. I'm saying that we are called to, we are invited to participate with God in our formation. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord because maybe what is pleasing to the Lord isn't always right in front of you. Maybe figuring out what's pleasing to the Lord isn't just on the other side of your bed sheet. Maybe it's down the hall. Maybe it's out the front door. Maybe it's down the road. Maybe it's in another town. Maybe what is pleasing to the Lord can't be always found under our bed sheets. In our sleepy faith, we must be diligent, not slothful. So wake up. God has fullness for you. I promise you that. I promise you. There are none of us here today that God does not have a full life for. And if you're sleeping on Him, 
then you are rejecting the fullness that God has for you. So stop avoiding the work that God has for you with the distractions of our entertainment. I think it was Neil Postman who wrote in the 80s that we're going to be entertained to death. Stop avoiding the work that God has for you with the distraction of your workaholism, your busyness. Stop avoiding the work that God has for you with the distraction of your sleepiness. Sabbath, yes. Rest, absolutely. But when it's time to wake up, wake up. Stop avoiding the fullness that God has for you because God has that fullness for you for a reason. It is for His glory. It is for His glory. The gospel reading that we didn't read today was John chapter 9. The story of the man born blind. Jesus heals this man and, and the disciples say, who, is, who sinned that this man was born blind? Him or his parents? That's the only rational explanation for why he was born blind. Whose sin is it? Do you know what Jesus says? Neither this man nor his parents sinned that he was born blind, but in order that the glory of God may be revealed. That is a fullness of life. Reveals the glory of God. And do you know what Jesus said to him? He told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He put mud on his eyes and said, now go. We're happy to maybe get the mud on our eyes, but you're telling me I got to go? You mean I got to walk? I don't know, this mud over my eyes is kind of making me sleepy, Jesus. Kind of dark in here, I like it. The glory of God is revealed in humanity fully alive. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the good news of Jesus Christ for us today. Amen.